57-year-old David Evans lived in Claremont, California in 1985. He was the vice president at a bank and a former school superintendent living alone after divorcing his wife. On October 13, 1985, David's body was found inside his home. He had been beaten badly and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. The discovery was made by Claremont police during a possible burglary call at the residence. Evans, a Duke-educated school administrator who had worked as a teacher and school superintendent before shifting gears midlife and entering the banking industry, had been a pillar of the community liked by everybody. Investigators at the time generated a few leads but were unable to identify any viable suspects and the case eventually went cold. Authorities took a new look at the case in 2006 after advances in forensic technology. They found a small amount of DNA left behind at the crime scene and fingerprints belonging to the suspect. In 2020, investigators confirmed that the DNA and fingerprints left at the crime scene belonged to Hillary Marcus Duplices. Furthermore, they established that Duplices had lived in the St. Gabriel Valley area at the time the crime was committed, not far from where David lived. They were also able to link him to David's stolen vehicle abandoned in Covina, California about two hours later. On May 2, 2022, Duplices was charged with ending the life of David Evans. He is currently incarcerated in a New York State prison, serving an extensive sentence for a similar crime and will be eligible for parole in that case in 2033. Duplices will soon be taken to Los Angeles, where he will be arraigned on the new charges. Lieutenant Hugo Renaga said they think they know why Duplices did what he did but don't want to reveal too much information before the case goes to trial. Renaga thanked the team of investigators, including those from the Sheriff's Office, Claremont Police Department, New York State Police, and the New York Department of Corrections for bringing long-awaited justice and closure to the family of David Evans. Twenty-five-year-old Lori House lived in Mountain View, California in 1992, where she worked as a computer engineer. On September 5th of the same year, Lori's lifeless body was discovered in her car in Mountain View, near a garbage dump about a mile away from her workplace. She had been strangled with a rope, which was still around her neck. Footprints were found on the inside of her windshield. Investigators identified a prime suspect, John Kevin Woodward, who was allegedly openly jealous of Lori. Woodward had developed a romantic attachment to Lori's boyfriend, who was also his roommate. In the late 1990s, Woodward was tried twice in the case, but both trials were unsuccessful. The case was dismissed by a judge for insufficient evidence after a jury could not reach a verdict following the second trial. Woodward's fingerprints were found on the outside of Lori's car, but investigators could not prove he was inside the car. Woodward moved to the Netherlands after the trial, where he later became the president and CEO of the Bay Area company ReadyTech, an online training company. Despite the setbacks, investigators did not give up on Lori's case and continued to follow up on leads and search for evidence. In late 2020, they resubmitted all the forensic evidence for further analysis. Over 80 latent fingerprints collected at the crime scene were re-examined by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office Identification Unit. This resulted in more fingerprints matching Woodward, placing him in locations only the person responsible for Lori's fate could have touched. John Woodward was apprehended by police at JFK Airport in New York on July 9, 2022, after arriving from Amsterdam. If convicted, Woodward faces life in prison. Deputy District Attorney Rob Baker of the Santa Clara County's DA office expressed satisfaction with the second chance to seek justice for Lori after nearly 30 years. He credited advances in forensic science for discovering new evidence that allowed the case to be reopened. Lori's family issued a statement expressing hope that justice can finally be served for Lori and appreciation for law enforcement agencies that have never given up on her. To honor Lori's memory, her family established the Lori House Memorial Girls Athletic Scholarship, providing donations to graduating female seniors. 12-year-old Leisha Michelle Jackson lived in Montgomery County, Texas in 1979. On September 7th, she left her home to spend the day at a community pool in her neighborhood. When she did not return home, her family became worried and called 911. The following day, her glasses were found. An oil field worker discovered her body in a heavily wooded area near a pipeline in Montgomery County. 
An autopsy report revealed that she had been assaulted before her life was taken. Investigators collected DNA from her body, which belonged to the suspect, and stored it for future use. Despite an extensive investigation that lasted for years, all leads were explored and the case eventually went cold. In 2021, investigators decided to revisit the case and utilized a new technology called MVAC. The MVAC system allows investigators to enhance DNA collection from porous and rough surfaces. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Squad used this technology in October 2021 to extract unknown DNA from Leisha's clothing collected at the crime scene. The unknown DNA was sent to Texas DPS forensic scientists who developed a DNA profile of the person responsible for her death. In 2022, investigators submitted the DNA profile into the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODES, which matched with a man named Gerald Dwight Casey. Casey had been executed in 2002 for taking someone else's life in Montgomery County in 1989. At that time, he was 34 years old and had killed 36-year-old Carla Smith while attempting to steal guns from another individual named Daryl Pennington. Before ending Smith's life, Casey had a history of multiple convictions, including burglary and drug charges. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office noted that this marked the oldest cold case solved by their department to date. What do you think about it? Let us your thoughts and comments below. 80-year-old Antonio Rodriguez and his 77-year-old wife Luz lived in Cleveland, Texas in 2005. Antonio, a World War II veteran, and Luz were beloved members of the community known for their kindness. They operated a small Mexican food restaurant from their home, serving shift workers at a local plywood mill. On April 14, 2005, the couple's daughter, Carolina Tejada, went to their home to make lunch for them. When they didn't answer the door, she entered to make lunch and discovered her father's body on the floor of their bedroom and her mother's body in their bed. Both had been beaten and strangled. Police dogs tracked the scent of a suspect across some railroad tracks to a nearby apartment complex but couldn't lead investigators further. Blood from an unknown suspect was found on a large rug in the couple's home and the DNA was entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODES, with no hits at the time. The case went cold for years. In March 2021, investigators re-entered the DNA sample in Cody's and found a match. The DNA was linked to Shelly Susan Thompson Lemoyne, who was serving time in a Texas prison for an unrelated drug offense. Lemoyne denied knowing the Rodriguez family or being involved in the crime. Another DNA sample was taken from her at the prison, matching the DNA found at the crime scene in 2005. She was arrested on July 8, 2022, outside her parole office in connection to the Rodriguez case. Cleveland Police Chief Daryl Brazid highlighted the significance of small pieces of evidence, such as the speck of blood on a piece of carpet found inside the home. For the Rodriguez family, it was a welcome development in a case that had haunted them. Carolina Tejeda expressed her belief that more people could have been involved in the slaying and Martin Rodriguez, another of the couple's children, saw the arrest as the first step in helping the family heal from the tragedy. He thanked the Texas Rangers, Cleveland Police Department, and the Liberty County District Attorney's Office for their efforts in restoring hope and faith in the justice system. Five-year-old Stephanie Haybert lived in Wageman, Louisiana in 1978. One summer's day in June, Stephanie left her Astro Lane home at about 2.30 p.m. She headed to a friend's house to play. Stephanie was wearing a pink checker top, pink shorts, and her ice blue prescription glasses. She never made it to a friend's house and she did not return home for dinner. Her parents, Joyce and Donald Haybert, called 911 to report her missing. Joyce was quoted as saying, This is hell. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, not even the devil. A multi-day search of the family's neighborhood ensued. The FBI joined the case, investigators ran down tip after tip. The Habeers even hired psychics, but no sign of Stephanie could be found. Five months later, a hunter discovered Stephanie's partial skeletal remains in a wooded area down a shell road in Royal St. Charles Parish in Louisiana. This is about 20 miles from Stephanie's home. Her body was tied up against the tree. Investigators could not determine how she lost her life, but could confirm that she had been assaulted. Detectives focused on Stephanie's then 16-year-old neighbor, Roger Alexander. 
Stephanie was friends with his little sister and she attended a sleepover at their house the night before she disappeared. Alexander maintained his innocence. On the day Stephanie went missing, he was a few blocks away at his cousin's house on Danny Lyon Drive, helping repair a car. Several witnesses vouched for him. Still, investigators insisted that Alexander was responsible. St. Charles Parish prosecutors presented a case against him to a grand jury, but they declined to indict Alexander. The Wageman neighbors who searched through the summer heat for Stephanie watched from their lawns as investigators repeatedly searched Alexander's home. Even after a 2008 DNA test excluded him, authorities did not declare him innocent. Suspicion also fell on 70-year-old Daniel Parks. He was a friend of the Hayberg family who babysat Stephanie. In 2014, he was sentenced to life in prison, convicted of assaulting a seven-year-old girl in 1979. The victim in this case testified that Parks once told her she would end up like poor Stephanie. Parks denied harming Stephanie and investigators could not find any evidence that he was involved. In 2003, Stephanie's mother Joyce contacted a man named Michael, who is the chief of the district attorney's victims and witness assistant division. Michael recalls that Joyce said to him when they first met, her case is just sitting there. Please do something. All I know is my child was tied to a tree and left for animals to get her. Mikkel met with prosecutors and detectives seeking new ways to identify the person responsible. In 2012, a distraught Jay Frank reached out to Mackle and said that he knows who took Stephanie's life. Jay said that his father, Jason Franklin Sr., was responsible. Jason was a U.S. Army veteran. He married Joyce Finette in 1970 in New Orleans and worked as an electrician's helper. The couple bought a home on Esther Lane, about five houses from Stephanie's home. Jason was a serial predator who targeted children. In 1966, he was convicted of attempted assault on a young girl. Jason targeted children who didn't tell because they had been threatened or were too horrified about what had happened. Other times, they weren't believed. Jay Franklin reached out to Mackle because his wife, Michelle Franklin, had convinced him he'd never know peace until he spoke up. Since childhood, he had bounced between homes, abused and traumatized by what he had been through. He was mentally damaged. Michelle Franklin said he didn't know what love was until he got with me. Over the next nine years, Jay Franklin revealed physical abuse he had suffered at Jason Franklin Sr.'s hand and how it links to Stephanie's case. Jay said that his father beat him and assaulted him between the ages of two and six. Jason Franklin Sr. also used his son to lure other victims, usually young girls, to their home under the pretense of a play date. Young Jay Franklin was sometimes forced to take part. Jay then told investigators one of those girls was Stephanie Habert. According to him, it was his mother, Joyce Finette, who abducted Stephanie and brought her to Jason Franklin Sr. Since both Jay and Stephanie's mothers are called Joyce, I'll refer to Jay's mother as Vinette to prevent any confusion. Jay said that when he was six years old, Vinette had coerced Stephanie into their car. Vinette then drove the children to a house in Lullen, Louisiana, where Jason Franklin Sr. was waiting. At some point, he put Stephanie into a car and told Vinette to follow. They then drove to a wooded area where Stephanie's body would later be found. Jason Franklin Sr. stripped Stephanie of her clothes and brush. Without realizing it, he directed them to the scene where Stephanie was found. Despite Jay Franklin's testimony, it still took authorities years to prepare the case. They had to determine what evidence was admissible, what charges he'd be eligible for, and definitely rule out the other suspects. Jay Franklin's credibility was bolstered by the statements of another victim who came forward. It was a 51-year-old woman whose story of childhood assault matched the version of events he told. She had never before disclosed the assaults. In 2018, 76-year-old Jason Franklin Sr. was arrested in connection to Stephanie's case. Her parents, Donald and Joyce, lived long enough to see him arrested. Both of them passed away in 2020. Unfortunately, the case never made it to trial. In January of 2022, Jason Franklin Sr. lost his life due to a respiratory illness while in prison. In June of 2022, 50-year-old Jay Franklin also lost his life due to a drunk driver. Investigators with the cold case team described it as a heartbreaking loss. Jay's stepmother Kathy Vanette said, I think he's the bravest person I ever met to be able to basically rip his whole life apart and put it out there. Kathy Vanette is married to Jay Franklin's stepfather, Henry Vanette. Henry was married at one point to Joyce Finette, Jay Franklin's mother. 
Without the suspect and the main witness, investigators officially closed Stephanie's case. Vinette currently lives in Alabama and hasn't been formally charged or arrested yet. What do you think about it? Let us your thoughts and comments below. On February 26, 1999, human remains were discovered in a wooded area near the intersection of Clifton Spring Road and Clifton Spring Church Road in Decatur, Georgia. An autopsy concluded that the remains belonged to an African-American boy between the ages of five and seven. He was wearing a blue and white plaid shirt, red denim jeans, and brown Timberland boots. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, authorities were unable to determine the cause and manner in which the boy lost his life. Unfortunately, they were also unable to identify him. The case went cold for many years. In May of 2020, a tipster came forward after seeing an artistic rendering of the unidentified child distributed by authorities. The tipster contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. She shared information about a woman named Teresa and Bailey Black living in Charlotte, North Carolina with her six-year-old son, William Deshaun Hamilton. In December of 1998, without notice, Black withdrew William from school and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Black later returned to Charlotte the following year, but without William. Detectives noted that she gave conflicting accounts at the time regarding her son's whereabouts. The tipster believed the boy found in Georgia was William because they looked similar. The Decod County Police Department, along with County Cuters, followed up on the lead and resumed actively investigating the case. Early in 2022, DNA linked Black to the child's remains. She was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona on June 29, 2022. She is currently waiting to be taken to Georgia. Authorities have not specified how William's life was taken or a possible motive. Angeline Hartman, the Director of Communications at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, said this case is the perfect example of why we never give up hope. For more than two decades, a woman in Charlotte followed her gut feeling that something wasn't right. She made phone calls, scoured the internet, and talked to anyone who would listen. We're grateful she never stopped until she found that rendering of William online and gave investigators the missing piece to help solve the 23-year-old mystery. William was a bright and artistic six-year-old, possessing a keen sense of humor, according to those who knew him. Investigators are now seeking the public's assistance to help piece together a more concrete timeline of Black and William's movements. Authorities say Black worked at a now-defunct Atlanta strip club known as Plizers and may have been getting assistance from the Atlanta Day Shelter for Women and Children for a brief period. On the morning of July 15, 1982, gravedigger George Key discovered the body of a Caucasian woman in the rear of the Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey. The body was found lying on its back just over a steep bank that leads to a creek below. The victim's face had been beaten beyond recognition with an undetermined object. The medical examiner estimated that she was in her late teens or early 20s. Examination indicated that the girl had attempted to fight back or defend herself from her attacker as trauma to her hands and arms was observed. The body was clad in a red short sleeve shirt and a skirt. After seeing images of the girl's clothing in a newspaper, a witness named and Marie Lonnie Mare told officials that she remembered seeing a girl wearing the same clothing as the victim purchasing cigarettes on July 13, 1982, just two days before her body was found. Latimer stated that she was shopping with her daughter at a super it across from the cemetery and observed she was able to describe the victim's clothing. The shirt and skirt themselves were traced to a manufacturer in western United States. Some people also said that they bought similar clothes at a store in Long Island, New York. The victim was buried on January 22, 1983, after she had remained unidentified for over five months. Since no one knew her identity, she was named Princess Doe. Donated funds were used to pay for a coffin and headstone. The headstone was engraved with text, Princess Do, missing from home, remembered by all. This is the first reconstruction made of Princess Doe, but did not lead to anything useful, unfortunately. For many years, Princess Doe was thought to be Diane Janistai. She was a missing teenager from San Jose, California, who vanished on July 30, 1979. This theory was supported by several law enforcement officials in the state of New Jersey. They went as far as to hold a press conference identifying Diane Dai as Princess Doe. In 2003, Princess Doe's DNA was compared with a sample of Diane's mother, Patricia. 
It was then conclusively determined that Princess Doe was not Diane Dye. In 1999, a woman named Donna Kenlaw was arrested in California for attempting to commit welfare fraud. When questioned by investigators, Donna decided to reveal that her husband, Arthur Kinlaw, is responsible for taking the lives of many women. Donna did not give any detailed information, and since Princess Doe had not been identified, it was difficult to prove that she was telling the truth and that Arthur was responsible. Arthur was, however, found guilty of many other crimes. Investigators did get Donna to tell a forensic artist what the victim looked like. This is the sketch that was then made. One theory was submitted that Princess Doe may have been a runaway and could have been an individual using false names while employed at a hotel in Ocean City, Maryland. In 2012, the case was looked into again. A new composite sketch was made depicting her as a blonde, not Burnett, like in the last sketch. Also in 2012, a sample of her hair and tooth were examined through an isotope analysis and indicated that the victim was most likely born in the United States. The sample of her hair indicated that she had lived at least 7 to 10 months in the Midwestern or Northeastern United States. The tooth sample indicated that she could possibly be from Arizona. It was also believed that the victim spent a long period of time in Long Island, New York. The case was featured on America's Most Wanted in 2012 in hopes to generate new information. The same year, the most recent reconstruction was broadcast on CNN. Additional composites of Princess Dew were made by Carl Koppelman that illustrated her clothing. In 2021, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children partnered with investigators and Australian forensics to help identify Princess Doe. On June 18, 2021, investigators received the news that Australian forensics agreed to extract DNA and construct a DNA profile. On February 10, 2022, Australian forensics relayed to investigators that the creation of a DNA data file was successful. The results were then sent to the National Center for Missing Exploited Children's Consulting Genealogists from Innovative Forensic Investigations. The managing officer was Jennifer Moore, who agreed to perform unlimited genealogy free of charge. On February 22, 2022, Innovative Forensics announced to investigators that they had a candidate for Princess Doe. Investigators then went to West Babylon, New York, where they met with Robert Allen York Jr. They believed he was the brother of Princess Doe. They also collected a DNA sample from Princess Doe's sister, which mitotyping technology used to build a mitochondrial DNA profile. The Union County Prosecutor's Office Forensic Laboratory assisted by creating an STR DNA profile through the victim's sister's DNA sample. Model typing technology then sent the DNA profile to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. On April 20, 2022, the center identified Princess Du as Dawn Olenek. She was formally announced on July 15, 2022, the 40th anniversary of her discovery. Her brother Robert said that Dawn left their home at her mother's request and was never seen or heard from again. Arthur Kenlaw has been interviewed again and he confessed. Kenlaw remains imprisoned at the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. Investigators are now looking to piece together Dawn's movements in the time leading up to her demise. Dawn Rita Olenek was just 17 years old when her life was taken. What do you think about it? Let us your thoughts and comments below. 19-year-old Lindsay Sue Beechler lived in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in 1975. She had just recently got married. At about 8.45 p.m. on December 5, 1975, Lindsay's aunt and uncle stopped by her apartment to exchange recipes. Instead, they found a horrific scene. There was blood on the front door, the entranceway wall, and on the carpet. They found Lindsay's body on the living room floor. She had been stabbed 19 times with two different knives and assaulted. Investigators collected all forensic evidence they could at the crime scene. There were no signs of forced entry. Witnesses also didn't hear or see anything strange. In 1997, as DNA advanced, detectives with the Lancaster County District Attorney's Office submitted Lindsay's underwear for DNA analysis. The lab found male DNA on it and could then create a DNA profile of the suspect. Recently, in 2019, investigators teamed up with C.C. Moore, who is the chief genetic genealogist at Paraben Nano Labs. Paraben created a composite sketch of the suspect based on the DNA evidence they had. In 2020, C.C. used DNA to build a family tree of the suspect. 
she found that he had deep roots in the local Lancaster community. She also found that the family tree of this unknown suspect contained many recent immigrant families from the tiny town of Gasserina, Italy. Finally, the search was narrowed down to 68-year-old David Sinopoli. Investigators learned that Sinopoli lived in the same apartment complex as Lindsay. To ensure that it was his DNA that was left at the crime scene, authorities began surveilling Sinopoli, who didn't go out much in public. On February 11, 2022, investigators were able to obtain Sinopoli's DNA from a coffee cup he drank from and threw in the garbage at the airport. DNA found on Sinopoli's coffee cup was compared to DNA identified from the male DNA on Lindsay's underwear. In June, investigators learned that the two spots of blood found on Lindsay's pantyhose were consistent with the DNA profile obtained from her underwear. Detectives had long believed that the suspect had cut himself during the attack. Sinopoli is being held in Lancaster County Prison without bail. Investigators do not believe Sinopoli and Lindsay knew each other. It was just a crime of opportunity. What do you think about it? Let us your thoughts and comments below.